Now I think we're live. Good morning, Grace Tribe. Wonderful to see all of you guys. I had to turn down the music. It's like, where is that? To turn down the music? It's so exciting to get to hang out with you guys today. This is the Grace and Coffee chat. Uh, maybe loud and proud, Rob says. Woohoo! I think that might be taken wrong, but I'm glad you're here, man. We are uh, in kind of a pattern that I love. I had it some time uh, off where I was not broadcasting for about a week and a half. And uh, this week we are back on strong. We had Bill Loveless on Triber Tuesday earlier this week. We had an incredible live Easter uh, chat on Sunday, which if you missed that, it'd be worth going back and catching the Sunday broadcast this last week was just really a sweet time. And so I encourage you to go back and catch that when you can. And uh, we are back in the swing of things. So Thursday is where we just hang out. I, my office from having been out of town is in complete disarray. <laughs> if I could easily do it, I would pay in the office. But uh, Louie, my puppy, barely has a place to lay down. <laughs> it's chaos after the trip. So uh, normally on Thursdays anymore, I'm hanging out in my easy chair, uh, got the camera and a microphone set up nearby so we can just hang out, put on the comfy sweatshirt, sip coffee and chat about whatever's coming up. But, uh, today, um, because of the disarray in my office, um, we're back at the normal, uh, desk shot today. And, but I want to encourage you, we are right back into the swing of things with the grace and coffee chat Thursday. So I hope you have something cozy to drink and are enjoying this morning. It's a little cool for us on, uh, in Texas, at least on this Thursday for this time of year, it's about 49 degrees outside where I am, I think. And, uh, again, for us, that's, that's pretty cool for spring. So anyway, I'm excited. We had a question on Tuesday that Bill and I, uh, on Triber Tuesday couldn't, you know, cover it wasn't directly pertinent. I don't think to the, uh, what Bill wanted to cover during that time. So we just didn't get there, but we had plenty to chat about, but, uh, I wanted to talk about it today. Our regular, uh, uh, Patty Stebbins, uh, Patty and Carl, uh, wonderfully ask uh, about guilt. Should there be godly guilt? I don't have the whole question in front of me, but she sent me a follow-up email. Actually, she sent it to Rob and Rob sent it to me, but I have a follow-up uh, just to clarify what she's getting at. And so I'm going to share that and we're going to talk about, should we feel guilty when we are sinning? Like, how do we, how does change ever happen if we never feel bad about what we've done? And so there's just a lot of error floating around about, okay, if I'm new in Christ and I'm not under condemnation, then shouldn't there be someone uh, feeling bad for what they've done? And so we're going to talk about that. What's the role of feelings in our walking in truth? What's the role of feelings in our walking in error? So that's where we're going to head here in just a little bit. But first, we want to spend a little bit of time chatting about whatever's on your heart, some prayer requests, some prayer updates. We've got about two minutes um, just, to, just to hang out. So I see in the comments, I think people are asking about the brand spanking new shiny uh, Facebook group that I launched. I think it was actually late. Tuesday night after book club. We're just kind of going, we're just chatting now. All right. So just some announcements catching up. If you don't know, we have launched a brand new uh, book club, the Grace Tribe Book Club. It's only once a month where we pick a book, we read the book, we get together and chat about the book. Uh, Ralph Harris was going to join us on Tuesday night from New Zealand, but because of some logistical things could not make it happen. But honestly, I got so sucked into the conversation. I forgot to even mention it. <laughs> I, and Rob and I, or I'm sorry, Ralph and I exchanged messages, but, uh, and keep him in prayer just cause stuff's, uh, crazy for him in traveling. And so anyway, uh, hope that uh, you will keep our dear friend of the ministry and a long time 
decades friend of mine, uh, Ralph Harris, the author of our last book, God's Astound, not God's Astounding Opinion View. I always say that. That's the original title. Uh, Better Off Than You Think was the original book. Where is it? Uh, highly recommend God's Astounding Opinion of You by our dear friend, Ralph Harris. He's been on the show before and will be again. Uh, love that dude. Anyway, just keep him in prayer because I don't know what all the logistical problems were and and uh, heartache and headache of uh, uh, getting to New Zealand and what was going on there. But keep him in prayer this week because if there was any way possible, he would have been on the show, uh, on the uh, chat for the book club. All that to say, we had a great conversation about Ralph's book and uh, just sharpened one another, encouraged one another, shared what we loved most about the book, some of the questions that spoke to us that the book raised. And now we got to pick a new book. So Tuesday night after book club, so 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, <laughs> I, um, uh, oh, yeah, you, you can't, you can't, um, well, I'll go back to that, Rob. Uh, late Tuesday night after book club, I started a brand new book club Facebook group. And it's only for those people who are signed up for the book club. So here's how this works. You send a message, as Rob is alluding to, to the ministry. We will add you to the Zoom list for the book club. And then we'll include a link for the um, Facebook group. And in the Facebook group, we can continue the chat because there's not nearly enough time. An hour and a half. We went from 7.30 to 9 and people just were chomping at the bit. It was very hard to end our time together, but we're going to because that'll go on just forever. Um, but we can continue to chat. We can pick our next book. We can ask pertinent questions as we go through uh, the book. We can, you know, just have ongoing chat about the book that we're reading, about what we want to do next, about why we like it, why we don't, what's useful, what isn't. It'll just be a great resource for those who are in the book club. So here's the best thing that you can do. Go to MikeQDaniel.com and get on the Aroma newsletter email list. Or if you already are, then open up one of the emails we've sent you from the Aroma newsletter in the past. If you're on the Aroma newsletter, you can reply to the newsletter and say, I want to join book club. And we will send you out the next Zoom link and we'll include you in the Facebook group. So that's what you do. You get on the Aroma newsletter list and you reply to the Aroma newsletter and we'll add you to the book club list. Simple as that. Not everybody's on the newsletter wants to be in the book club. That's fine. But if you want to be in the book club, you got to be on the newsletter. It's just a subset of our newsletter group. Everybody got that? Rob, I know you field a lot of these questions. Want to make sure that it makes sense. So uh, if you're already on the book club list, on the Zoom list for our book club, we've got to pick a new book. So go to the Grace Tribe Book Club, Grace Tribe Book Club group on Facebook and just request to join. And uh, if you're on our Zoom list, I'll add you to our, uh, our group because I would love for you to do that. I couldn't because not everyone follows the ministry is actually clicked follow in the ministry, or maybe you're not, uh, your content isn't public, which is totally fine. I couldn't add people automatically on the group. So you've got to request it. But if you'll go to the group, just search in Facebook, fa uh, the uh, Grace Tribe, uh, Grace Tribe Book Club. You'll find our group. Started by me this week. It's brand new. No comments but my own so far. And, uh, just request to join the group. I'm excited to add you. There's already a poll up about our next book. So our next book uh, might be The Rest of the Gospel by Dan Stone. Wouldn't it be great to read that together? I've read that. I bet I've read that. I was going to say a thousand times. Surely that's an exaggeration. I've read that hundreds of times. In part because there was a season in ministry where I was teaching it over and over and over and over. So we could go through the rest of the gospel by Dan Stone and uh, his co-author, Greg Smith, whom we might be able to get to join us on the book club. Good friend of mine. Uh, we could also read a C.S. Lewis book. I'm really wanting to revisit uh, The Weight of Glory by C.S. Lewis. That's on my list. 
Uh, we also, uh, let's see, I have the whole stack here I pulled out. I thought we might consider, uh, if I can put my hands on them. There we go. Uh, I thought uh, a uh, book that people would want to read if you haven't already is The Indwelling Life of Christ by Ian Thomas, Major Thomas. I've been really blessed to speak at some of his Capernway uh, sort of youth uh, ranch schools and uh, really blessed to be able to do that uh, a few times. Some of their retreats I've been able to, to speak at and love uh, Major Thomas. There's some things that I might share differently than Thomas has, and so this would be a great book for us to go through together. Uh, we are looking at, as I mentioned, C.S. Lewis is the way to glory. There's lots of versions of this book out there. It doesn't have to look like this, but, uh, we'll want to get the same book so that we can do page number references. But anyway, this is one that I want to read again. So we could do that together. We're considering doing Watchman Knees, uh, the normal Christian life. Uh, that's one that I put on the list and, uh, thought that would be awesome to do with you guys and be able to talk through because again, uh, the context and perspective and goal and audience that is being targeted by an author matter. And so we need to consider who's writing it in what context and to whom, just like we read scripture. Whoops, there we go. Uh, and so that would be something good for us to read together because we can sharpen it for our perspective in our circumstances and with us as the audience, because we may not always be the people uh, in the same context as the author or the same audience as the ones he's writing to. So some of this can be adjusted for us and 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 maybe sit a little uh, more solidly in our soul. So anyway, there's one that I love. And then lastly, um, I got to write one of the... Uh, intros for my good friend Frank Friedman on uh he sent me his little uh caption there uh on one of his books I had a pre a pre-copy and to be honest uh while I bought the book I read it before it came out and uh haven't read it since the final copy came out so I'd love to read Frank Friedman's Stunned by Grace with you guys. And we could certainly try to get Frank on. Uh, Major Thomas and Watchman Nee are, and C.S. Lewis are all passed away. We won't be getting them on the book club except in spirit. <laughs> and us, you know, the union that we have. But uh, yeah, these are all things that we might be able to do together. And uh, if you had another book that you wanted to suggest in the new uh, Grace Tribe Book Club group, uh, then you can suggest that there. You first have to get on the newsletter. If you're not reply to the newsletter that you want to be in the book club, and then we'll add you to the Facebook group and send you the zoom link for our next meeting, which is the first Tuesday of every month. Listen, I didn't mean to take up that much time, but I love these books. Uh, there are many more that I want to read or reread this year. So, um, would love to do that with you. And we don't have to read just grace-based Christian authors when we do it in the context and the, the, the safety of sharpening one another, encouraging one another in the truth of new covenant. In other words, it opens the door for us to read some things, and we will, that we want to read that have great value, but maybe aren't pure new covenant grace-based identity in Christ indwelling life books because we can sharpen and and take care of each other in that process. And so uh, books that I never recommend or rarely recommend, we can read together. Isn't that awesome? I just love that. So uh, we will do that. And so if you have a suggestion or something you want to read or something that you wanted to read, but you didn't didn't want to be sort of discouraged in the truth of Christ as our life. Um, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's add it to the list. And so we're going to do one a month, first Tuesday of every month, 730 central time is book club. If you can make that even once a month, even every other month, if you can make it a book club, uh, it's a great encouragement to us because we get to, uh, sort of be committed to the reading process together. So 
Anywho, wow, that was a lot of talk about book club. I just loved book club. It was our second meeting, first full book. Um, and I failed to mention that, that Ralph couldn't join us. Obviously, he didn't join us on the book club uh, Zoom. But uh, it was fantastic. I love getting to see all of you guys in the book club. Uh, normally, we're like this, where I see your comments scrolling, most of them. And uh, you see me. And we... You know, I get to know you pretty well because you share your heart, you share prayer requests, you chime in on our commentary. And so if you've been a part of our uh, clan here for the broadcast, our our coffee chat uh, for a while, then I've gotten to know you pretty well. But it's strange when I see you because I often think, how how do I not know what you look like? Or how do I not know how you pronounce your name? Or how do I not know your voice? Because I feel like I know Marie better than I know Marie. And I know Marla better than I know Marla because I've not seen uh, or heard from Marla herself. I've seen comments that reveal her heart, but don't make uh, our communication as personal as it does in the book club. So honestly, I have an ulterior motive of being able to get you guys uh, on screen and on audio for us. Now, Rob, uh, Rob Roke and Donna Winter and a handful of you guys that go way back, you've been to conferences and sermons that I've preached and have been a part of it. We've done breakfasts uh, uh, events together that you guys have been in. So we go way back. <laughs> so I, some of you I really do know <laughs> and, and love that I get to do this work with you. Uh, last announcement, If you have, uh, of course, if you have prayer requests or prayer updates, we'd love to uh, hear from you this morning. I'm just talking through that time a little bit today to catch up because I've been, I've been out of the country for uh, the better part of a week. So we're just catching up on some announcements. Listen, uh, while you're sharing, while we're coming in and just saying, hi, I'm kind of talking over the din of everybody chatting. That's good. Uh not quite officially started yet, just making some housekeeping announcements. Um, our ministry, Mike Q. Daniel Ministries, is launching several, let's call them projects, several arms of ministry. We're recruiting leaders in different areas of counseling and coaching, raising up some consultants to work with churches and other nonprofit organizations for different areas of leadership and worship and preaching from the truth of life in Christ according to scripture. You know, if the new covenant is true, which I believe it is, then everything we do should be aligned with the new covenant. And until that is the case, trying to operate under an old covenant authority structure or a modern corporate authority structure is going to create problems for leaders who are indwelt by Christ and not operating from new covenant reality. So there's great benefit in coming to a leadership paradigm, a worship paradigm, uh, a demographic outreach paradigm, a mission vision strategy paradigm that is aligned with the truth of the new covenant. If we are in the, the new covenant, which we are, if we are under grace, which we are, then counseling should be done from a new covenant paradigm. And it's just often not. It's done from a fleshy, do better to earn more, sow in the flesh well and reap well from the flesh paradigm of, of counseling. Coaching should be coming alongside people and helping them see how the new covenant they have embraced or maybe are learning to embrace, uh, how that affects what they're going through in their day-to-day -day circumstances as uh, ministers, as parents, as uh, uh, spouses. At, how does the truth impact their immediate circumstances? So the reality is the new covenant is getting met, missed in ministry leadership. It's getting missed in Christian counseling. It's getting missed in one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, it's getting missed in even discipleship training, which is ironic because there shouldn't be any discipleship training outside of New Covenant Truth. So we are raising up folks that are uh, professional counselors, coaches, consultants, who are experts nationally in their area of, of expertise as worship leaders, as uh, uh, 
uh, visionary strategic uh, coaches as consultants, but we're going to be uh, coming together and sharpening new covenant reality of Christ as life as it pertains to each of those disciplines, as it pertains to leadership development, as it pertains to worship leadership, as it pertains to, to youth outreach, as it pertains to uh, church pastoring, as it pertains to the crises that the body of Christ goes through and need uh, intervention and counseling for, as it pertains to coaching and coming alongside leaders and what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We're raising up those folks and we need support, honestly, to be able to do uh, what we do because we can't possibly charge nonprofit churches and nonprofit leaders what corporate coaching and consulting normally costs. <laughs> but like the way that is a viable industry is impossible for people ministering to the church and to leaders. And just as we're launching, see, the enemy is such a jerk. The enemy of your soul is such a jerk. Just as we're launching, uh, some of the folks that were excited about what we're doing and are supporting what we're doing have entered into some of their own circumstantial and financial setbacks in their life and totally understand that. So we've uh, lost some of the commitments for funding that we're going to make that possible uh, in our thinking. So the question now becomes, how do we fund the leadership team that we are raising for what God wants to do and the infrastructure for what God wants to do. And so we are raising up those leaders. We are launching the websites. We are coming alongside the church. We are going to do Christian coaching. We are going to do leadership mentoring. We are going to do uh, new covenant based Christian counseling and discipleship training. We are going to do all of those things with a group of people, not just me, but with a group of people, but in order to do that, we need infrastructure and support to be able to reach people that can't pay the price, the going rate for coaching and consulting and counseling. And so we need, we need support. That's just what that means. So, um, my income is not the goal. My, uh, ministry to you guys is not at risk. <laughs> like, like I'm not begging for support for us to do what we already do. That would be insane. And it drives me crazy when I see people going, if you want us to do what we're already doing, then pay us more than we're already making. See, I just am never going to say that. I'm so blessed that we, uh, I mean, as long as God allows, we are going to continue doing this online ministry with Mike Q. Daniel Ministries. But we are launching um, kind of unofficially this next week and then more officially in the month ahead. We are launching by faith what God has brought together of a group of people that I've been raising up for a while now, uh, the MQD group, a division of Mike Q. Daniel Ministries. And the MQD group is uh, not as funded <laughs> as I thought it was going to be. The MQD group, consulting, coaching, counseling, uh, coming alongside leaders at every level, coming alongside churches at every level. And the thing I am most excited for in this is we're going to equip you guys with some tools to reach out to local churches. So if you've always wanted, you love your local church, you love your pastor, you love your youth director, you love your worship leadership team, you love your home church group, um, and you would love for them to be, have a venue, a resource to grow, to have... Um, New Covenant discipleship conferences to have uh, 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 coaching and counseling available from a New Covenant perspective. Um, wow, what a wonderful resource for you to have at no cost to you, for you to be able to offer those services to the ministries that you're connected to. And so we are, we're doing it. We're going to not only do that work. We're going to equip you to reach your local ministries and leaders for the cause of Christ in their life. And uh, so two things. One, be praying for us and be watching for that. The MQD group, a division of Mike Q. Daniel Ministries, is going to be giving you opportunities to reach churches and leaders in your area at no cost to you um, and at a reduced cost to them, if any, uh, the, the expense of, uh, of, of making it happen versus the profit of it. And so for the, 
for the cost of the expense of just making it happen. Wholesale, <laughs> the wholesale cost of, of that counseling and coaching and training and ministry. Uh, we're going to, we're going to make it happen. It's got to happen. It's got to happen. And it can't just be me. It's got to be a team of 10, 20, 50 people making it happen. So, um, that's where we're headed. So watch for that. Please be praying for that as we're getting that off the ground. Um, number two, there are amazing Christian counselors and coaches out there right now. They're, they know the truth. They're teaching the truth. They're intervening in the truth. And we don't want to pull them away from where they're ministering. We want to funnel people to them under the umbrella of my Q Daniel Ministries. In other words, I want them to be more successful and have more people and more resources than what they've got. So we're not recruiting people from their ministries. We're actually going to funnel people to their ministries. So if you know of someone that maybe wants more intervention in local churches, maybe wants more people uh, to fill their counseling practice, and they know Christ is life truth, then I would love to help them be even more. I, I'm starting to use the phrase wildly successful because we're so scared of fleshy success. Uh, but I want, if they're called to do counseling for Christ, let's fill their practice. If they're called to minister to the local church, let's uh, uh, give them a huge footprint in their local communities. Let's make them wildly successful for the cause of Christ. And, and the way to do that is to help them with tools and resources to um, get the flesh patterns and coping mechanisms out of the way to market for them that they exist on a national scale, which we're going to do anyway. We might as well fill those people's practices and churches that are teaching life. So if you know those folks, um, then you let me know or let them know to reach out to me on the website at MikeQDaniel.com. We're still kind of in pre-launch, but it's coming. Uh, and then lastly, if you've ever thought about becoming a monthly partner with this ministry to support what I'm doing and reach more people through this online venue of ministry, um, one, that's a fraction of what we do. And two, we sure need it now. Uh, what we are doing, uh, some of the funding that we had earmarked for launching the infrastructure and leadership teams for consulting and coaching and counseling, uh, some of those funds we thought we would have, we don't have. So if you want a partner to reach the body of Christ individually and corporately in the U.S. and abroad, um, pray, just pray, just pray about supporting the ministry. I double dog dare you to pray about it. And if God says, no, 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 that's not where we're going to use your funds. We're going to put it over here. Then don't do it. <laughs> you ever had someone tell you not to contribute to the ministry? Don't contribute to my ministry if that's not what God puts on your heart. But if he does, if you're willing to pray about it and you're willing to do it as he leads and he does put that on your heart, then trust him and do it partner with us. Uh, don't do it out of compulsion. You're not under obligation. You're not going to lose anything if you don't. I don't know how to set you free any more than that. You're not under any compulsion to do it. There's no condemnation if you don't. You're not even going to gain anything if you do. <laughs> you will gain nothing by contributing to this ministry except that you get to participate, the joy and the fulfillment of participating in what we cannot do by ourselves. We just can't do it. We've got to come together to do it. And so our shared resources, our shared giftings, our shared opportunities, our cumulative impact to reach the church is transformational for the body of Christ. It already is. It's already seeing huge impact. But if you if you care about that and don't need to spend all of your money for personal benefit, then let's do this. Let's do this. Those of you that support this ministry, you have no idea the joy that it gives me to get to do this work with you. Rob, you, you, know, you and I mean, I can just go through the list. Rob and Marla and uh, 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 Donna and uh, Susan, people who have supported either monthly or occasionally, Walt, 
I mean, I love that I can't do this without you and I don't have to. Isn't that just biblical? I can't do what is necessary without the body of Christ helping the body of Christ. And and I don't have to. It's just not meant to work that way. You can't do what God calls you to do unless he does it in through you. And we can't do what he's called us to do corporately unless we as the body do it together. Christ in us doing that indwelling life thing with the body for the body. Man, it's it's just where it's where life is at. And so there is such joy and fulfillment for me that I get to and have to do this work with you. And so I just wanted to take a few moments. Uh, I clearly don't do this every week. I rarely do it. But, um, you know, it, I'm not looking for doubling. If you partner today, we will double your gift. We're, we're not doing that. We're saying God can do whatever he wants. And God has called us and given us the opportunity to do something that I've just never seen done. I've never seen done anything like what we're starting to see and are already doing, but are taking it to a, a whole different level. For decades, I've been doing this ministry coming alongside the local church and leadership teams and doing discipleship conferences, but I've never seen someone raise up a group of people to do anything like what we are talking about and beginning to do. And so I, I would just love to do it with you. I would just love to do it with you. Uh, Corey, Corey with his small church and, and heart for God and our relationship, coaching relationship over the years, Corey supports every month, this ministry out of his, you know, it's not over abundance of funding that he has. And you just have no idea, Corey, he's living proof church word study. You just have no idea, my friend, what joy that is to me out of our pocket every month. Well, our income, a big chunk of our income goes back, personal income goes back into the ministry. Um, just because, I mean, what else am I going to put money into? Uh, I don't need really nicer anything. Uh, and, and some of you, that's not the case. So I totally understand. Don't feel any compulsion, any uh, guilt, uh, except the joy of getting to participate and do what you want to do. And let me encourage you that you can do that. So anyway, I'm so excited about it. I, I just, I can hardly sit still and I'm tired. I actually, this is me with a pretty bad headache this morning. I'm just so excited about it and, and want you to, uh, want you to participate if you can, because it will be such joy for you. Uh, I know for a fact that Rob and Corey and Donna and Marla, and uh, just looking at my the comments, uh, I know that those of you that are, it's just Walt, it's just joy. Sheila, it's just joy. I mean, they're doing it because they love doing it. Because I don't interact, honestly, uh, Maybe to a fault, I don't really interact with those that are donating any differently than I do with those that don't. Like, it doesn't change what I do at all. You're not gaining, earning, causing anything for selfish benefit. That's just not even possible. Um, uh, Andrea, thank you. You actually can. Uh, not that you need to, but you can donate in Canadian dollars. And I will double check that on our website because we've changed our funding uh, mechanism a little bit online. But I will make sure that within the next week, you can donate in Canadian dollars if you would like, um, because that is certainly uh, uh, viable. And we reach people, you know, we have people who watch this broadcast each week that are in uh, other countries and certainly Canada and Europe, I have been able to, to donate. So we will make sure that that's working with our new mechanism, but that can and should happen. And then um, uh, there are some other countries that we've had to do a little finagling with that mechanism to be able to get them on South Africa. We have a donor from South Africa. We have uh, um, some folks from some, some other areas. Uh, we've had people from uh, India that have made donations. So, but we may need to, uh, uh, adjust something for you. So if you have a problem making a donation from another country, please let me know. And we'll do the work to make that possible for you. Because honestly, Andrea, you know, you might give $10 a month. It might 
you know, and the cost of, of making that available to you, if it for some reason isn't working right now, might actually be almost as much as what you donate, but it's so worth it to me to get to do it with you. Like, that's why we're doing it. We want to do it together and we want to do it for the body of Christ. It's not really about the dollar amount. It's about getting to do it together. Obviously, we need the funding to do it. So um, anyway, I sure do love getting to do it with you. I'm sorry I harped on that so much. I want you to A, know what we're doing. B, really understand my heart with the people that are partnering with this ministry and your opportunity to do that. And three, C, <laughs> make sure that you guys know... Um, Oh, Tabitha, also one of our sweet partners every month. Just love that you are here. Saw Tabitha hop up in the comments. Um, just wanted you to know what we're doing with those funds and and that we have a need. Uh, we have a need. I think God, here's a little nugget for you guys. I think God gives us a need, so we'll include other people in what we can't do without the body of Christ. That Christ in you gets to participate with Christ in me and what only Christ can do with us, what only he can do through us. I think he gives us a need so that we can experience the heart of God through one another in a way that we couldn't do in any other, any other way. Does that make sense? Nancy, thank you so much for being part of this ministry. We are praying for you, my friend. Uh, love you guys. So Patty, my dear friend Patty, asked a question uh, on Tuesday, and I thought we would chat about it. On Thursdays, we're just hanging out. We're just chatting. You're hearing the heart of uh, each other and of me, and we're talking about what we're drinking coffee. We're just hanging out. We're commenting on each other's comments. Um, that's just what we are about on Thursdays. Tuesdays, we do the Triber Tuesday interviews. Thursdays, we talk about whatever is in our heart and see where God takes us. And I have a direction that God's going to take us here for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and you know, Sundays, we share a structured teaching on a video on YouTube. That's what we're doing, Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. I'm thinking about adding more time back because I just miss it when I don't do it. Is that, I knew I was going to be doing some traveling and stuff and we've cut our uh, broadcast down to, to three days a week, but but I, I don't like it. <laughs> I want to do it more. So I'm praying about that. But for right now, it's Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. And so here's what Patty asked. She uh, asked, what about, uh, what about feeling guilty? You know, the body of Christ is teaching that you're not under any condemnation, that your sin doesn't fracture your relationship with God once you're saved, that there's not more and more and more and more and more forgiveness that you need to ask for. Once you've been forgiven, Christ has paid for all of your sin so that you could be made completely new and you're no longer in sin, in Adam. You have been placed in Christ, in union with him, seated in him in the heavenlies, forever. That work is already done and it's not getting undone. You don't get unborn. So what about sin? What about guilt? If you can't be condemned, then shouldn't you still feel bad about behaving badly? Shouldn't you feel badly about behaving badly? So that's the question that I want us to delve into today. And Patty sent a clarifying uh, comment and here's what she said. And I love this because Patty, I think, understands uh, the perspective here, but wants some clarifying language, I think. But she said, there's just a lot of air floating around that since God has forgotten and forgiven even future sins, then when we sin, we shouldn't even be conscious of it. Talk to God about it uh, or think he will even be aware since he's forgotten. Maybe you can get this comment to Mike. Oh, she was sending this to Rob to send to me this morning. Um, and I think she's so right. Patty, you're so right. Here's the problem. If I teach, you're under grace. Sin doesn't matter. That's error. If I infer that since you're under grace and you're made new and you're no longer in your sin, you can no longer be condemned. So sin, when you behave badly, when you're acting contrary to your new creation identity in Christ, when you're operating as if you're a sinner, since you're no longer a sinner, it doesn't matter. My friends, if that is implied or stated, 
that is error. Sin matters. Sin matters. And I'll tell you why. Sin hurts people. If righteousness is relational, which it is, it is not behavioral. It is relational. Walking in and living from my union with Christ is righteousness. He's not going to lead me to not kill somebody. He's not going to lead me to not lie to people. He's not going to lead me to not covet. Do you know what he leads me in? Loving people. You know what he leads me in when I walk in the fullness of Christ, in the freedom of Christ for uh, the sake of his heart towards others, then I'm loving people in practical ways. I have joy that I share and peace that I encourage and kindness that overflows from my heart. He produces fruit in me for other people to taste the goodness of God. God loves people through you. That is the righteous life. Righteousness. You can see righteousness behaviorally, but you can see plastic fruit and mistake it for righteousness too. So that's not righteousness. Doing something nice is not righteousness and not sinning is not righteousness. Listen, if you go through this entire day without so much as a sinful thought, you've not lived righteously. You just not stumbled in sin. There's nothing righteous about not sinning. It's a relationship. Now, here's the great news. If you sleep through this entire day because you're in Christ, you slept righteously. He's your righteousness. He's enough. So first, we have to teach the error of righteous performance, self-righteous performance. That's not righteousness. And the problem is that Patty is alluding to is as soon as we do, People start going, so you're saying it's okay to sin? No, no. I'm saying you don't even want to sin. Let's, let's figure out what righteousness is first, and then let's figure out how to live that way. What if sin isn't the issue? When I commit a sin, when my heart is darkened by deceit, when I am operating out of distraction from the fullness of Christ's life, then my thoughts, my feelings, my behavior, my choices are sinful. And that's hurtful to others, but it's also hurtful to me. You want to know who I can't hurt? I can't hurt God. God is fine and he doesn't forget who I am. So I'm not condemned, nor is God daunted by my sinful behavior. What he wants is something more for me and for those that he could love through me. What he wants is more for me to live out of the joy and fullness and divine participation of his life in and through me. That's righteousness. Sacrificially loving Rob Roke, though Rob's pretty easy to love. Sacrificially loving Kathy Falstitch, though Kathy's awfully easy to love. Sacrificially loving Marla and Jenna and Vanessa and Rich and Walt. My brothers and sisters in Christ, sacrificially loving you guys requires Christ's sufficiency because what it costs to love, Christ affords by grace. We can afford by grace. Does that make sense? Love is sacrificial and we can afford it because Christ is enough. So, First of all, we have to teach a grace that is bigger than all sin, or we're not teaching grace. But once that's true, what do we do about sin? What do we do about sin? And I think that's a critical and wonderful discussion. So let me pull up my right page here. <laughs> um The enemy is such a jerk. The enemy is just a nerd. I used to have a t-shirt when I was, I guess I was in youth group or college or something. It said, the enemy is a nerd or Satan is a nerd. And he is. He's a total jerk. He's a total dweeb. 
because first he deceives us into thinking that what I want is something that's harmful to me and to others. That something that I want is unloving and unfulfilling. He first deceives me. And then if I catch on and think, oh, I, I don't want to do that. I don't like that. That's not who I am. If I catch on to him, then he guilts me. He condemns me. He uses his deception against me and my having believed the lie that led me into sinful behavior and thinking and feelings. He, he condemns me for what he did to me. <laughs> he deceives me and he distracts me. And if I realize that I've been deceived, if I realize that I'm distracted from the sufficiency and fullness in Christ, then he condemns me for doing it. Like as soon as I realize I'm acting out of anger that's unrighteous, as soon as I realize I'm acting out of covetousness, as soon as I realize that my feelings are based on a neediness that isn't true of me, as soon as I'm triggered right by something in my past to react in a harmful way, uh, he's the one that's using that trigger to cause me to act that way. And then if I catch on and go, I'm acting that way because of the hurtfulness from the past, that's not how I really feel about people. That's not what I really want for Jim Bob. The reason I'm acting that way towards Jim Bob is because someone who wasn't supposed to hurt me hurt me. And if I'm reacting out of past pain towards someone in the present, then first I'm deceived and I don't realize I'm doing it. And when the Holy Spirit comes to me, he doesn't say, stop that, you horrible kid. He didn't ever say that to me. He says, Mike, you're okay in Christ. You don't need to get blood from a turnip. You don't need to ring someone else out for the life that you lost as a child to someone who you should have been able to trust. You don't have to react out of fear in this circumstance because someone else wasn't trustworthy. Christ is enough for you. When the Holy Spirit comes to you and I and says uh, and addresses your sin, he's not going to condemn you for it so that you feel bad and try harder. That's the wrong roller coaster, my friends. He's the Holy Spirit is never trying to get you to feel badly so you try harder. He's going to convince you of who you are so you can live out of his fullness. It is not out of guilt that we walk in righteousness. It's out of what I call conviction, but that's become kind of a loaded word in grace circumstances. It's with being convinced of the truth that I increasingly live out of the life of Christ. He's not going to make me feel bad to try harder. He's going to give me revelation of the truth so that I operate out of greater joy. He's going to show me how unfulfilled I am by sin and how sufficient Christ is by grace. How unfulfilled I am by sin. Not to make me feel bad, but to set me free from the lying belief. He's going to show me how unfulfilled I am by sin and how sufficient my life is by grace. Do you see it? Those two things coming together. Look how much better you off you are in Christ than you are even if your fleshy behavior worked. Even if you could control outcomes and beat down oppressors and overcome people's unfair behavior that's never going to satisfy your soul, even if it worked, even if that positive flesh effort or negative flesh uh, uh, paradigm, even if those things work, they're never going to satisfy you. You're going to love your haters. You're going to live for God's agenda in other people's lives. You're going to operate in supernatural joy and peace and kindness, not circumstantial peace and joy and kindness, because honestly, there is no such thing. God is not going to make you feel bad, so you try harder, which is really what we usually mean by guilt. You're not guilty. In the, in the uh, jury decision of God as judge, jury, and advocate, you will never be found guilty to God.
if you're in Christ. And no matter how good you behave or act or pretend apart from Christ, you're only guilty and he's not causing your guilt, but he wants you to see it so he can set you free from it. With God as the judge, the jury and advocate regarding your sin, he finds you innocent in Christ. And if you're a believer, if you're in Christ, if you're saved, knowing that the weight of his grace, the cost of his sacrifice, the joy of that love, what it cost him for me to be right with the Father, that's more motivation. That's more encouragement. That's more truth aligning than guilt could ever be. As Andrea is saying in the comments, I'm not guilty. I'm just living out of a false identity and I feel bad that I'm not doing better. What if it was never up to me to do well enough? What if I have to trust God to do what only he can in and through me? My guilt doesn't lead me to trusting him more. My sinful behavior convinces me of how much I hate sin in Jesus and that he's enough for me, that life is Christ, not me doing better. So you've got to be careful. Guilt is a lie for the believer. So again, the judge, jury, and advocate regarding your sin, if you're in Jesus, finds you innocent. And my innocence is a bigger compeller, is more compelling to me. The love of God is more compelling than a false guilt about my behavior as if I could have ever behaved well enough in the first place. So what it does is it drives me into relationship in love with Jesus who leads me in all righteousness instead of making me feel bad about my behavior and trying harder to fix it. Guilt is not the solution. In fact, guilt isn't even true. In Christ, I don't fundamentally have a sin problem. I have a source problem because the sin has already been paid for. So we need to what we need to learn and watch out for the hamster wheel of fleshly behavior. My feeling bad or having a need and wanting to do better, so I'm trying harder and then I fail worse and then I, you know, give up completely. That sounds more like a bad addiction process than a godly process. Oh, I hate that I keep shooting up with whatever I'm shooting up with covetousness. And then as I try harder, I just fail worse and prove to myself more and more and more that I can't fix me. Well, the solution is not to run that gauntlet better. The solution is to get off that hamster wheel completely. That's the wrong roller coaster for you and I, my friends. The ride you and I want on is the the riding in Christ as the roller coaster car life. We're going to hop in him and he's going to be enough. And where he takes us is going to be a wild ride, but he's sufficient for it. And as I trust him, then I don't react to people's flesh patterns, to people's untrustworthiness as much out of my own flesh patterns. I can, though I don't always, I can live free of the fleshly roller coaster and live from the sufficiency of Christ. I can say, oh, look at that. They're being mean to me. Good thing I don't need them not to be. I need loved, but they're not the source of it. I need accepted. I need companionship. I need value and security, but they're not the source of it. So it's an awfully good thing that that person not getting me doesn't cause me to not be got. I'm already got by God. <laughs> it's horrible English, but it's a great truth. I don't need that person to get me. I don't need that person to be great at loving me. I don't need that person to uh, fulfill me. Not that I don't need those things. They're just not the source of it. For the believer, and really for the unbeliever as well, all sin is just based on deception. The problem is the unbeliever has no other source for life. 
but the flesh. So they're pretty easy to deceive. They have no other options. There's only one option and it's based on a lie. Good luck. <laughs> you only have one source of life and it's you. Good luck. So it brings us his love, his kindness, his sufficiency, his grace, all proven through the cross, brings us to submission, to the place of trusting him instead of our, ourselves, putting our hope in him instead of in me for life. It's not just for forgiveness. Forgiveness makes life possible. What I want isn't just forgiveness. I want life. And so our hope is in him. Yes, for forgiveness. Praise God for the cross. But there's no life in the blood of Christ for forgiveness. The blood of Christ for forgiveness is necessary for resurrected life. I'm in union with him, so I'm resurrected with him. So I get to enjoy the ride in him. Let's get on the right ride. Let's get on the relational righteous ride with Christ. Someone should write that down. That's really good. Let's get on the relationally righteous ride with Christ. And whenever I know that I'm living a path based on the error of if I can, then I get, if I do, then I'm okay. If I can cause, or if I fail to cause, then I'm right or wrong by how well I do or how badly I do. That whole economy is error. Listen, sin matters, but it's not yours to fix. The reason sin matters is because the enemy will use a, it to deceive us into trying harder and convincing ourselves even more of how bad we are. He'll just deceive us more by our failed efforts. But the spirit will lead us out of self-fulfilling failure into Christ-fulfilling righteousness. Sin matters because it's the opposite of love. I'm not living loved nor letting God love others through me when I sin. Instead, if I am willing to love someone else, then God can lead me in righteousness in their life, in our relationship. That out of my relationship with God, through the grace of Christ, I lack for nothing in him. I don't have everything right? You can cut me off in traffic and I might be running late. You can be mean to me and I might be hurt, but that doesn't have to define my reality. I have all things in Christ. I don't have everything in my circumstances. I don't get everything from everyone, but I lack for nothing in Christ. I'm just living from the wrong source. I'm not trying to overcome sin as a Christian. Sin has been conquered. I'm choosing to sin because I'm being deceived. Sin has no power over me. I'm just deceived. It doesn't even change who I am. It doesn't change my relationship with God. It doesn't change what he can do in and through me. He even uses my sinful, fleshy behavior and coping mechanisms to bring me to dependence. If I listen to the spirit, then he moves me from the roller coaster of the flesh to the joyous, wild ride of righteousness. He does it every single time. If I just listen to Christ, who's loving me in sinful behaviors, maybe I should trust him instead of putting my hope in me over and over and over and over. Uh, you can go and do a search, I think, for uh, my talk in uh, YouTube about um, the flesh cycle, the flesh cycle, um, because there's a whole process that we walk through in response to our the lie of neediness. And I was going to kind of go over that today, but I've already taught it. And this has been, I like the roller coaster thing we're talking about a lot more. Listen, you don't want to overcome sin. Sin has been overcome and you're not the cause of it. You're not the cause of your own overcoming. You get to just walk in righteousness that only Jesus can earn and cause and has and given you. He is the righteousness. You have no righteousness by your behavior. You're not more righteous when you act like it. You're not less righteous when you don't. He, 1 Corinthians 1.30, 
Christ is your only righteousness. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we in him might be the righteousness of God. Christ in you, you in him. Y'all relationally are the righteousness of God. You're not trying to become something and you're not trying to overcome something. You're learning to walk as who you are and in what you've got and in relationship with the one who's got you. It's a wonderful, relationally righteous ride in Christ. When you find yourself in sin, the enemy will declare you guilty. Don't believe him. Do not believe him. In fact, it is by knowing the truth of what the spirit speaks to you and the lie that the enemy speaks to you that you stop getting sucked into more lying beliefs, that you stop trying to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and try harder, which then when you fail, just hurts you more, just condemns you more. That cycle of lying beliefs and fleshly effort and then coping mechanisms that just hurt you more. So what we're going to get more drunk or shoot up more drugs or get stuck in more uh, unhealthy behaviors, just lash out in greater rages of anger or uh, what do we get? Every time we try harder, we just fail again and then we need to cope more. That cycle of the flesh, that roller coaster of flesh is not the same as hopping in the car with Jesus and just enjoying him driving. He can take you where he wants you to go and he can do through you what he alone is capable of. How about we enjoy the righteousness of Jesus in us? He's the only righteousness you're ever going to get. The problem part of the time for people like me, very positive flesh, pharisaical type flesh patterns from my childhood on, that's just going to be the pattern of my sin forever. Um, but that didn't define me and that's not who I am. And I don't like it when it happens, when I beat people over the head with good ideas, that's not. That's not righteousness. Loving them sacrificially is righteousness. And I can only afford that because I trust Jesus. Anyway, friends, the reality is you are uncondemnable in Christ. So when the enemy is declaring you guilty, the spirit is going to go, hey, 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 look at me. I'm your life. I'm in you. You're okay. The problem is you think you're not. So you keep trying to fix you and that leads you into sin and then you fail and then you're coping. Flesh patterns that fail lead to coping, and it's all just sin. You trying to be good enough is sin. That's what Adam and Eve were doing. Let's, let's fix our sin problem. Stop it. They were in perfect relationship with God, but instead of trusting him, put their hope in themselves. Your superpower, one of a few. Your superpower in Christ, Christ in you. Dun, dun, da, 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 da. Your superpower, you see, uncondemnable. You cannot be condemned. When the enemy declares you guilty, the Spirit's going to remind you that you're complete in Christ. And the reason we sin isn't because we want to. It's because we forget who we are and we don't believe God about how well off we are, how enough he is, what it looks like to love, and that we can afford it by grace. And when I try to be good enough to cause, to fix, to control the outcomes of my life so that my circumstances are more secure and other people are more affirming and I have more fleshly value and I cause more of my provision by my own effort and merit, or when I do that religiously, I'm going to do really well for God so that I can earn those things from him. When I try to be the cause of life, that's called the flesh. It is sin. And when I am trying to be a better idol, a better source for my own life, I'm going to fail. And when I fail, I cope. I do things that are self-harming and others harming out of my failure to be bad at being God, my own source of godliness. You're really bad at being God. Really bad. And when you fail at being in control, 
when you fail at sovereignty, when you fail at your own sufficiency, when you fail at causing your own security, when you fail at being your own source, you cope. And most people recognize shooting up with drugs is sinful. What they don't realize is it's their failure to be good enough at controlling the world around them and controlling their own behavior and controlling their own thoughts and controlling their own world and controlling all of the outcomes. When they, when they fail at being God, that's why they are coping. And they only recognize the coping is sin. When the trying to be good enough on your own is the, the first domino, it's getting on the wrong ride. And then Satan can take you wherever he wants you. He, you just got you by the nose ring and he's pulling you around where you want to go. The reality is you can stop letting him do that when you stop letting him declare you guilty. Stop believing him when he does. Start laughing at the false declaration of your guilt. Listen, the prosecutor of your soul will say, he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty. But you know what? It's not up to him. You ever seen these shows or maybe you've been in court and uh, the prosecutor stands up and he just accuses. He's the accuser. He's going to he's going to stand before the jury and do his opening statement. He's going to go, you'll find out that Mike Daniel is just as guilty as guilty can be. Here's all the things he's done. Here's all the circumstances that prove his guilt. Here's, here's all the reasons. Isn't that horrible? Hasn't he done horrible things? He's guilty, guilty, guilty. And you need to find him guilty. And then God comes to the the saint and he goes you know what christ knows jesus and jesus is his righteousness he's not lacking for righteousness at all his behavior doesn't make him guilty jesus makes him innocent in me he's in the family he's good i don't condemn him you shouldn't either and they declare me innocent again and again and again and again and again my behavior doesn't make me guilty christ makes me righteous who are you going to believe the accuser of your soul or the judge and jury of Jesus who has paid for your freedom from the lies of the enemy. You were never meant to cause your righteousness in the first place. You were never meant to cause your righteousness in the first place. That would glorify you even if you could do it. You were always and only meant to depend upon Christ for your righteousness to the praise of the glory of his grace. When you fall on a hope on Christ, when you trust that his grace must be enough for you, when you look to God and say, I sure do hope you love me today, they always go, yes, 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 yes. Every promise of God is yes and amen in Jesus Christ, Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Christ is enough. You are okay. So let's use the guilty lies of the enemy to remind us of the truth of the sufficiency of Christ because you hate sin in in jesus if you're a believer you hate your sin if you're not in christ you actually hope to get away with your sin because you like it you want it to work out but in christ it's kind of like a child who does something wrong and they're terrorized not just because they're afraid of what's going to happen the consequences once they're found out but they don't like that they're hiding it they hate lying to their parents a you know, child, I remember as a kid, I knocked over a, a little bird figurine that my mom had and it broke off the wing and like, oh, what do I do? And I put it back up there and tried to stick them together. And I don't remember if I tried to glue them together. Or I don't know what, it, but you know, it's just obvious that I did it. And I was, I hated trying to hide it more than I was, and I was very afraid of the consequences, but I hated that I was hiding it more than I hated the consequences, feared the consequences. And with your heavenly father, it turns out that the consequences are Jesus already paid for those. Jesus already paid for the consequences of your sin so that you can be vulnerable with God and he can prove himself enough for you. He's working on your relationship, not your behavior. But in relationship with him, he'll lead you in all righteousness. He's working on your behavior. 
I'm sorry. He's working on your relationship, not your behavior. But in that relationship, he will lead you in all righteousness. Let me say it again since I messed it up. Christ is working on your relationship, your trust of him who is sufficient for you. He's working on your relationship, not your behavior. But in that relationship with him, he will lead you in all righteousness. Does that make sense? He's working on your relationship, not your behavior. You are who you are by birth, not by how hard you try, not by your behavior. You trying to be good enough was never the right path anyway. So when the enemy tells you you're guilty, I'm not saying you don't sin, and I'm not saying sin is okay. I'm saying you're freer than that, and fulfillment is an entirely different path. So let's get off the roller coaster of fleshly effort to be righteous and stop believing the guilty conviction of a guy who it's not even his choice to declare is guilty. He can say you're guilty all day long, but it's not up to him. It's up to Jesus. And Jesus has paid for your righteousness with his very life. And my friends, the cross was enough. The cross was enough for you. When you are being declared guilty in your soul, right? The enemy is telling your, your mind and your emotions and your behavior, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. Well, that's just the prosecutor screaming at the jury going, he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty. And the jury goes, well, we'll see. What's the evidence? Oh yeah, Jesus paid for his sin. There's no sin left that he hasn't paid for. He's fine. He's in the family. He's good. You're together forever. You can't. You can't use information that isn't pertinent. It's called circumstantial, right? It doesn't prove him guilty. The reality, he's been set free. He's been paid for. The sentence has already been paid for. There are lots of people walking the streets today, rightly, not because they didn't sin, but because their sin, their crime has been paid for. If you go to jail for 20 years for stealing bread, let me tell you, when you get out of jail, you have paid for your crime. Your crime, your sin has been paid for. Believe him. The enemy accuses you. God has any, the way he can do it is because he's right about your behavior and he's wrong about you. He's lying to you about you. And because you agree with him about your behavior, you believe him about you. But you're not your behavior. You're a child of God. You're a righteous and holy reborn child of God by grace and grace alone. So he gets all the glory and you get none, but it's no less true. So my friends, stop believing the lie of guilt and start believing the righteousness of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 127, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you not you for him, is enough. The cross was enough and Christ is in you and he's your source of righteousness even when you don't act like it. So start believing him and you're gonna act more like it. You're gonna put on the truth of who you are and take off the lie of who you're not. Start wearing the clothes of one who's been set free instead of keep putting on and trying to make work the clothes of it's up to you. That's the difference. We, we keep making sin about effort. And it's really about where your hope is. You aren't going to walk. You know, Jesus never said, today I'm not going to kill anybody. And I'll be righteous because of that. He said, I do what my father shows me. I hear what my father tells me. I say what I hear from him. I do what he shows me. That's the righteous life. And he came up out of the water and God said, this is my son. See the relationship in whom I'm well pleased. It's because of who he is, not what he's done. He's not done anything yet. His ministry hasn't even started. And Jesus believed him and lived like the truth was true. He never sinned, but it wasn't because he was trying not to sin. And it wasn't because he felt guilty. He never sinned because he lived out of relationship with his father, who, by the way, is your father. So live like that. Yeah, live like Jesus, dependent. 
Live like Jesus, walking in relational righteousness. Live like Jesus, radically available, ridiculously graced, overwhelming, overflowing in love. That's the Christian life. I hope that helps in a very real way, my friends. You don't have a sin problem. You have sinful behavior, but that problem's been fixed. If, if my faucet is leaking and I keep going under there and tightening it, I'm really not accomplishing anything. Our trying not to sin is foolishness. Let's walk with Jesus. And as we love people supernaturally and we want great things for others and we're trusting God to be enough for us when other people attack us or reject us or... Uh, cause instability in our life and circumstances. Listen, when we're overflowing with love and goodness and kindness from our innermost being in Jesus, those things just don't change how we react in flesh and coping mechanisms anymore. Let's get off the roller coaster of guilt and sin that the enemy keeps coaxing us onto to try harder. And let's just hop on the right ride. You don't, there's no climbing out of sin and finding Jesus, my friends. We just start walking like the truth is true. We start riding on the wild ride of relational righteousness in Jesus. And it's wild because you're not in control. That's why it's wild. You don't know what's going to happen next, but you don't have to. He's enough for you. He's enough for you for where you are so you can trust him with where you're headed next. And that trust, that hope in him, not you, sets you free from the lying beliefs about your behavior. So sin matters but it's not who you are. Sin matters, but it's not who you are. Let God use those flesh patterns and coping mechanisms to show your inadequacy instead of making you try harder so that you'll recognize that hamster wheel of trying and failing and giving up and coping and then deciding you're going to try even harder and then failing even harder and feeling even worse and coping even more. Let's just get off that cycle. Let's recognize it for what it is. It's a lie that you don't have to live anymore. And deliberately choose to focus your heart and hope on the sufficiency of Christ in you who has rightly declared you not guilty. You are not guilty. I'm acting as if I am. I'm trying to prove that I'm not. Stop that. You're not guilty. You're whole. You're innocent. You're righteous in Jesus. Stop trying to cause your righteousness. Stop trying to self-justify and your failure will stop leading you into coping and hurting other people. I don't hurt other people because I'm sinful. I hurt other people because I'm trying to get what I need from them. I don't have to. I'm freer than that. All right. I love that James in the book of James says, resist the devil. When you're tempted, resist, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. He's not saying try harder not to sin. He's saying realize that your temptation is from an enemy and stop believing him. Go, no, 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 no. I don't believe you. I'm not the source of righteousness. I'm not the cause of the coping. I'm not going to get on your ride anymore. Resist the devil. It's, it's, a, it's the person of the enemy of your soul that is tempting you in, into sin. Well, you don't have to believe him anymore. You have an entirely different source. Stop trying to be good enough and resist the devil who is lying to you and trust Jesus, walk in righteousness. Resist the devil and he'll flee. He's not saying resist sin, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. The goal of the Christian life is not not sinning. The goal of the Christian life is walking with Jesus. And guess what? You never have to not walk with him. You can't not walk with him. That doesn't make sense. You can only walk with him because he's not leaving. You can only walk with Jesus. He's not leaving. How about we do that on purpose and stop believing the enemy? All right. Enjoy him, my friends. Enjoy his sovereignty instead of trying to cause your own. Enjoy his sufficiency instead of trying to cause your own. Enjoy his security instead of trying to cause your own. And you will experience the freedom that is already yours, the righteousness that's already defining your relationship, the innocence that Jesus' blood bought on the cross for you. Enjoy what he's done. Enjoy who you are. Enjoy what you've got because there is no more. There is no better. There's nothing left. You're lacking nothing in Christ. So quit trying to be the cause of it in the flesh. And you aren't condemned for it. 
but you don't have to live that way anymore. You're not condemned. You don't have a sin problem. You have a source problem. Live from your hope in Christ instead of your hope in the flesh, and you'll not experience much sin anymore. I recognize an awful lot of my flesh patterns, but God keeps showing them to me because they get more and more complicated, <laughs> and I get freer and freer from them. But but I still step in that mess and get on the wrong ride all the time. Believe the Spirit when he says you don't have to live that way, and just stop. Believe Jesus. Believe the Spirit when he says you don't have to live that way. And just stop. The choice is yours. The cause is Christ. You can't cause it. You're, you're never going to be the cause of righteousness. You can never cause it. The choice is yours. But the cause is Christ. So trust him. Know him today. Grow in grace today, which means you're depending by faith on the sufficiency of his grace instead of you trying to earn or cause something, fix something. And as you know him more, who is your life and is completely yours by grace, you're going to grow in that grace. And as you know him more and grow in grace, you are naturally and unavoidably going to be overflowing with the love of God. You're going to go love like crazy. You want to know what the defining reality of the righteous life is? It's loving like crazy. You don't have to try to do it. It's the byproduct of being dependent upon his grace instead of your flesh. And that comes from knowing how much he loves you and how sufficient he is. So as you know him more, you're going to grow in grace. And as you grow in grace, you're going to overflow with love like crazy. Make that the reality increasingly. And when you don't, don't be condemned. Realize the truth. You're free of that. When you fail in the flesh, don't fix it. Stop walking in it. You're not the fixer. But you're friends with the one who's already fixed it all. Fix your eyes on Jesus instead of trying to fix your behavior, and you're free. Fix your eyes on Jesus instead of trying to fix your behavior, and you're free. Let me say it again. Fix your eyes on Jesus instead of trying to fix your behavior, and you'll be free. Just trust him. Believe him. Follow him. And righteousness will be the fruit of your experience sure do love you guys. Tune in on Sunday. Partner with us if you can. I sure do love getting to do that with you guys. Thank you so much for those of you that do. And uh, I will catch you on the flip side. Have a fantastic end of your week in him. Thank y'all.